the last video, we talked about how, according to general relativity, massive objects curve the geometry of space-time around them. And if we have a large enough mass compressed into a small enough area, we can get a region where if you enter that region, no matter what you do, you cannot escape. And we call this a black hole. The outer edge of the black hole is called the event horizon. It's the point of no return. And at the very center of the black hole, we have the singularity, where all of the mass of the black hole has collapsed down into an infinitely small point. So now we're going to talk a little bit more about the properties of black holes and try to correct some of the common misconceptions about them. So to start, just how large are black holes? Or how close can we get before we hit the event horizon and can no longer escape? Well, if you have a black hole that's not rotating, then the event horizon is spherical in shape, and the radius of the event horizon only depends on the mass of the black hole. The greater the mass in the black hole, the larger the radius. And the relation is actually very simple and is given by the equation, the radius of the event horizon equals 2gm over c squared. And in this equation, m is the mass of the black hole, g is Newton's gravitational constant, it's just a number that we, we know and have measured, and c is the speed of light, again, just a number that you put into this equation. The mass of the black hole is simply the mass of whatever originally collapsed to form the black hole, plus whatever has fallen into the black hole since then. Putting in these particular values and using some nice units, we can actually write this out even more simply as just three times the mass of the black hole over the mass of the sun kilometers. Which means that if I have a one solar mass black hole, a black hole that weighs the same as the sun, the radius of the event horizon is three kilometers. If I have a black hole that's 10 times the mass of the sun, the radius is 30 kilometers. If the earth were somehow collapsed into a black hole, it would only be about two centimeters across. So again, to produce the black hole, you need to compress a huge amount of mass into a very small space. With such extreme conditions required to form a black hole, you might ask, how can black holes form at all? Well, the best theorized mechanisms for producing a black hole is the gravitational collapse of a star. So during the star's life, we have a star and we have the core of the star. There is a fusion reaction going on inside the core of the star that supports it from collapsing. The fusion reaction creates heat and pressure, and that stops the outer layers of the star from free falling into the core. The natural trajectory that the outer layers of the star want to take are free falling into the core, but that heat and pressure stops that from happening. However, the core of the star will eventually run out of its nuclear fuel. And when that happens, this fusion reaction will stop and there will no longer be the heat and pressure required to support the core against collapse. So at this point, a couple of things happen. First, the core of the star collapses down very rapidly. And when this happens, there's a burst of energy that actually expels the outer layers. The outer layers of the star are blown away and we are left over with this collapsed core. Now, if this star is a low mass star, kind of like our sun, then there are other forces that can come into play and stop the collapse of this core. But if the star is large enough, uh, over 20 times the mass of the sun, then the core of this star, which collapses, is going to be greater than four times the mass of the sun. And at this point, there's really no known forces that could stop this from collapsing all the way down into a black hole. Now, there are a few other mechanisms that could also form black holes, and we'll talk more about those in later videos when we get into a little bit more detail on what supermassive black holes are. Now, another common misconception is that black holes suck up absolutely everything around them. Now, it is true that if you cross the event horizon and actually enter the black hole, there is no way that you can get out. 
However, if you're reasonably far away from the black hole, then gravitationally it acts no different than any other mass. So as an example, let's consider the Earth-Sun system. So we have the Sun and we have the Earth in orbit around the Sun. Clearly this is not to scale. If by some means the Sun collapsed into a black hole right now, then the orbit of the Earth would not change at all. There would be absolutely no difference in how the Earth orbited the black hole than how the Earth orbits the Sun right now. Unfortunately, all life on the Earth would still be wiped out since there would be no more heat and energy from the Sun. But don't worry, this cold, desolate Earth would still orbit around the black hole just fine. As a side note, we don't expect that the Sun is heavy enough to form a black hole, and we don't expect the Sun to do anything else strange for a few billion years or so. So, not something to lose sleep over. Another interesting point is that, in the same way that we see many systems where we have two stars that are in a binary orbit, they orbit around a common center of mass, we also have strong reason to believe that there it's not that uncommon for black holes to be in binary orbits with other stars. So both of these objects will orbit a common center of mass. This probably started out as some uh, two stars orbiting each other and then one collapsed into a black hole and the other hasn't. And since they're separated by a great enough distance, they'll just continue to orbit each other as if nothing happened. We also have reason to believe that there are many systems where we have black holes orbiting other black holes. And these binary black hole systems are actually expected to be very strong sources of gravitational waves. And one of the things that the NanoGrav collaboration is trying to do is detect gravitational wave signals from supermassive black hole binary systems. Uh, but again, if you're far enough away from the black hole, then you can orbit around just fine. It acts no differently than another gravitational object. It's only when you get very close and eventually cross the event horizon that you cannot escape the black hole. So what would actually happen if you were to venture into one of these black holes? So let's use a space-time diagram to illustrate our journey into the black hole. So we are going to free fall into this black hole and there's going to be a spaceship over here that's going to document us as we fall in. So they're hovering outside of the event horizon. We are free falling in. So we can draw the light cones for points on our trajectory. And as we get closer to the black hole, these light cones are going to tilt more and more until they are tilted enough that we're actually into the black hole. And then as we fall in, every second we're going to send a signal to our spacecraft to just say how we're doing. So this first one is not very curved, so it might arrive at our spaceship at that point. This second light cone is closer towards the black hole. So even though only one second of time passed when we sent the signal, this spaceship is going to see a huge delay on how much time has passed before they receive these signals. And as we get closer and closer to the black hole, this is going to become more and more pronounced until we hit the event horizon. And when we hit the event horizon, the signal we send at that point is never actually going to reach this spacecraft. The result of this is as we fall into the black hole, from the perspective of this spacecraft, it's going to look like we're moving slower and slower and slower and we're going to get dimmer and dimmer as we approach the event horizon and they'll never actually see us cross the event horizon. However, from our perspective, we will cross the event horizon just fine. The event horizon isn't a physical barrier that you'll run into. It's simply the point where light signals that you send can no longer get back out of the black hole. However, as you continue towards the singularity, something else is going to happen. Now, let's say that you fell into the black hole feet first. So there are your feet, your arms, and your head. We said in the last video that space-time gets more distorted as you get close to a large mass. 
Well, if you fell into the black hole feet first, then your feet are closer to the singularity than your head is. Correspondingly, the light cone that's at your feet is going to be more tilted than the light cone that's at your head. And part of what this means is that the natural freefall trajectory that your feet want to take is different than the natural freefall trajectory that your head wants to take. And it's up to your bones and muscles to exert forces on your head and feet to keep them from naturally moving apart. Now, we call this a tidal force, and this force which is required to keep you from coming apart continually increases as you approach the singularity. Eventually, you will be, as it is sometimes described, stretched out into spaghetti and pulled apart. It doesn't matter what you're made out of or how strong a spaceship you build to fly into the black hole. As you get closer and closer, even the atomic nuclei making up the atoms in your ship will be ripped apart by these tidal forces before hitting the singularity. So, important safety tip, don't go into a black hole. The outcome would be unpleasant. So, how do we actually know that black holes exist if they don't emit light and we can't actually see them? Well, the first way is by observing the gravitational interaction between invisible black holes and visible stars around them. So here we have an incredible video from the European Southern Observatory, and I'll post a link in the description for this video. And this shows a combination of actual observations taken over more than a decade and computer animations based off of those observations of stars in the very core of the Milky Way galaxy. So here we're zoomed in on the stars that are at the very center of our galaxy. And you can see that they're actually orbiting this one central point and sometimes when stars go very close to that central point they move very rapidly. So based off of these observations we've been able to determine the trajectories of all of these stars and they're all orbiting something that is 4.3 million times the mass of the Sun and all of that mass is in a region that is at most a little bit larger than our solar system. That's as far as we've been able to narrow it down based on current observations. Now, although this is still significantly larger than the expected horizon radius of a black hole of this mass, there are really no other realistic models of how you could have that much mass in that little space without it forming a supermassive black hole, which is what astronomers think is at the center of the Milky Way galaxy. So I see this as very compelling evidence that there is a supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy. So again, I highly recommend that you look at the link in the description and check out that video for yourself. I think it's some of the best evidence that we have that black holes actually do exist. However, it's not the only evidence that we have. There have been many observations of very bright and energetic events in space which are best described or best explained as coming from accreting black holes. That's where you have a black hole and there's some kind of dust or gas cloud that is falling into the black hole. And what happens is as this dust and gas falls inwards, it speeds up and also heats up to incredibly high temperatures, millions of degrees. And we can see this superheated gas glow very brightly before it finally plunges in past the event horizon and we can't see it any anymore. This spinning uh, disk of gas also can create very strong magnetic fields that basically create a natural particle accelerator that can shoot out into space with incredible energies. And we've seen these kinds of structures in space as well. So although these objects are too far away for us to currently be able to see with this kind of resolution, uh, of course, this is an artist's impression, we do see signatures of the kinds of signals that this sort of system would produce. So we have a substantial amount of observational and theoretical evidence that suggests that black holes really do exist. And the Nanograv collaboration is working to detect gravitational wave signals 
produced by binary supermassive black holes. And we will talk about what we hope to learn about black holes from these observations in the next video.